My path has led me to this place. It has prepared me to be a United States Senator. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not waiting for anybody to anoint me or tell me that it's okay. I know that a lot of us in this room are anxious about what we see happening to our politics. We're anxious because we see the influence of money in politics. We're anxious because we know that there are people who are trying to disenfranchise voters. I put on the uniform to defend the, from the enemy without. I stand before you today to defend from the enemy within. And that enemy is those people who truly want to ensure that the democratic process belongs to the few and not the many. I look in this room and what I see is Democrats. And I know that's beautiful. Because you, you are the ones who desegregated this country. You are the ones that stood up for women's rights. You are the one that ensured we got weekends and overtime. You are the ones that made sure that we made America work for everybody. You ought to be proud to be Democrats. I know I am. Now some of you want to know, what am I going to do when I get there? And I'm going to tell you. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to advocate for those things that we value. It's one thing to reach across the aisle to the other side. I know some in this race make a big point of that. It's a whole other thing to convince them to reach back to us. You see, I've spent a lot of time around my conservative brothers and sisters a lot. You see them in the Navy, in corporate America. I speak fluent Republican. <laughs> but what's more important is that I have learned how to engage my conservative brothers and sisters without hating them. And that's really, really important. Because you don't get anywhere when you call everybody a Nazi. You have to be able to engage. And you have to embrace the process of engagement. It is engagement that brought us from no gay marriage to gay marriage being the law of the land. And you know why? Because when you engage people, they have to explain why they believe what they believe. And sometimes that explanation starts to fall real short. This very week, this very week, the Confederate flag came down from the capital of South Carolina. And that didn't happen because people weren't talking. That happened because people were talking. It's about engagement, but more than engagement, it's about advocacy. It's about being able to put it into words, to put it into action. Now, I know there are really critical issues that are facing our country. I mean, you know some of them. I want to talk about what those issues really are at a more granular level. We talk about Social Security Day. We have Democrats talking about raising taxes. We have Republicans talking about cutting benefits. But who's talking about the fact that the 401k is nowhere near a pension? Who's talking about the fact that millions and millions of Americans are going to have nowhere near enough to uh, savings to retire at all? Who's talking about the fact that so many of our seniors may have Social Security but don't have enough to live in dignity? Don't know how to, don't have transportation to get to their medical appointments. Live alone and isolated. Who's talking about that? We've got bigger problems than just that one question. Yes, we have to keep Social Security viable, but we need to rethink retirement and what it's going to look like in 50 years. Somebody's got to have the courage to bring that up. We have people who are losing access to education every day because it's being priced out of their range. Should it be a choice between being educated and being in debt for the rest of your life? Should that really be the choice? I don't think so either. And my question is, how do we talk about that in an intelligent way? How do we come up with solutions? We know that there are countries in Europe that have free college education. And we see that model, and there's something to be had in that. But we have the most diverse, profound, wide, fabulous secondary education in the world. You can go from anywhere from community college to Harvard. 
We don't want to lose that diversity, but we want to have a track, at least a track, so that everybody who wants the college education can get one. That's what we need to talk about. We Democrats are in support of raising the minimum wage, and I support that too. But what about those families that make more than the minimum wage, but not enough to raise a family? Who is talking about actually closing that income gap? We know it's there, but do we know why it's there? We know why, I can tell you why it's there, because markets are created. The market for labor is created by employers. And then I wouldn't call it a conspiracy because it's not a conspiracy. But they put downward pressure on wages. No company wants to pay more for overhead, which is what employees are, than they have to. They create that market and they make sure that they contain that cost. It's about cost containment. Ironically, there's also a market for CEOs. Interestingly enough, they have no interest in containing those costs. But the question is, is there a way to incentivize corporations to put more money in the hands of everyday employees, regular working employees? And I think there is. I say, hey, if you're a corporation, let's lower your tax burden to the extent that you spread that money amongst your employees. It's an interesting idea, no? Because it's not raising taxes. And it's putting real dollars in the hands of Americans who will turn around and spend it in the economy and send some of it back to the government in income taxes. That is a tax-cutting way of putting money in the hands of our employees. I think it's a good place to start. I don't want to overstay my welcome for indulging me. It is an honor and a privilege to be in front of you and to allow me to share some of my ideas. I finish with this thought. We Democrats are the ones with the good ideas. Our heart is in the right place. We are the ones who operate out of hope and not fear. But we have to be willing to take back our process. Our candidates cannot be selected by the party, they have to be selected by the people. Because the people have the best judgment. They really do. Collectively, you have the best judgment. And when there is a candidate that is intelligent, exciting, honest, competent, and authentic, we will engage the voters, and we will turn them out, and we will win in 2016. Thank you so much. We do have microphones here at the side, um, and we do have a, about 10 minutes um, for questions. Now, I'm going to be very strict with this. I don't want statements. I want questions. <laughs> and I will cut you off. <laughs> okay, so no statements, questions for Pam so she can answer. Yes. 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Yes, please. Yes, could you please tell us what is your position on the Cuban embargo? Um, I personally am really in favor of opening that embargo and, and creating that connection. Um, my view, and I'm going to keep it really short, my view is that 50 years of isolating Cuba hasn't really done much. Um, and I honestly believe that uh, the lives of Fidel Castro and Raul Castro are not infinite. They're going to pass on at some point. At the end of the day, we want to build a relationship with the Cuban people. I think all of us want a free Cuba where people can have decent lives. We are the best example of that for them, and we can help them by reaching the hand of diplomacy. Yes.
Absolutely. We, if you see my uh, staffer Leah, we have palm cards that have you know where I stand on the positions, and I also have you know obviously access to the website. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Don't know exactly what that does, but you know I'm in that bridge in that gadget. You know, but there's lots of ways. So yes, we have palm cards. Um, we have information, obviously pledge cards, and obviously uh, donation envelopes, which are very very important. Every campaign needs resources, and so does mine. So yes, thank you. Um, yes, I am in favor of not only CPIE, but quite frankly, the gap between the cost of living and Social Security is even bigger than what we have in our legislation. And, and let's keep in mind, it's going to get bigger and bigger, right? So I am most certainly in favor of that and actually making it more robust. Second of all, I am very much in favor of Social Security covering hearing aids, vision aids, and things, and dental care as well. Uh, I don't know how you have a quality of life if your mouth is killing you because your teeth are coming out. Sorry. Um, you know, I, you, my mother used to tell me the idle mind is the devil's workshop. She told me that when people have uh, little prospects, when they feel disconnected from their community, when they don't have hope, um, when they feel like they're constantly disrespected, that's when they turn to negative influences. Um, we have to continue to engage our Muslim brothers and sisters so that those who are, have good, positive hearts and minds know that we accept them, open our arms, and are willing to help them engage with them to talk to their own young people to keep them away from that negative influence. Pam, could you comment on the TTP? Oh, yeah. You know, I believe in trade, but I know the that the idea of being able to enforce work protections in a trade agreement is nonsense because we cannot reach into other countries and change their work culture. We're not going to tell Vietnam to stop using child labor. That's not going to happen. We can't enforce some of our own work rules here, let alone be able to get a country to enforce theirs. So I have some problems with TPP. I did not support that. Um, I don't believe in having an opaque negotiations process where the Americans have no idea what you are agreeing to and then get stuck with the ticket. we have a system that is very much set up to help incumbents stay incumbents and it and and I think that um, you know I definitely did my due diligence to try to introduce myself to the folks in the party the party leadership and their attitude was that they had already decided it was going to be the candidate and they just were not interested in what I had to say so I had to just kind of slog through it um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be negative and and be all upset about it I'm just going to work my way through that Thank you so much for that question. Talk to your leaders, call them, say, hey, I met Pam, I heard her speak, I think she's the real deal. Definitely you can help by, you know, helping me with resources. Can't lie, that's a big part of what uh, the, uh, the pundits and the powers that be uh, use to measure whether you are or not a viable candidate. Definitely put it out on Facebook and Twitter. Some of you are in that. A lot of you are in that. You have friends, you have family, you have churches, you have synagogues. Spread the word. Connect to my campaign. I have a terrific field uh, organizer here who is happy to get me to your clubs and your meetings and your churches so that I can do this from a grassroots perspective. That is fully 100% my idea and my intent. I'm staying with the grassroots part of this. 
That's what I'm going to do. Talk to people one on one because there's nothing that supplants that connection. From my point of view, and maybe I'm naive, but if I convince you by talking to you and meeting you and connecting with you, no amount of commercials is going to change your mind. But when you see those articles in the paper, you see them online that say there's only two people in the race, post on it, comment and say, oh, no, there's not. There's three people in this race, at least now. And there may be more. But thank you for the question. Yes? What are your, is, what are your views on gun control? <laughs> I, I'm a lawyer. I'm an officer of the court. I have to respect the law. The Supreme Court has decided that people have a right to bear weapons. And, and you have to respect that. Um, but I definitely think that there are some intelligent things that we can do to reduce the likelihood that people with ill intent use those weapons to take out innocent lives. Uh, what happened in South Carolina broke my heart. And that was a sign of, the, uh, of a system that failed and collapsed within itself. Um, I would like to see us look at what California is doing with respect to the ability to, uh, for family members and friends to get temporary um, stays on, on people who have guns that are, have shown signs of mental illness. The court in California, California did a really interesting thing about allowing it, friends, family of people who have weapons to go to a court and say, we believe this person is a danger to himself and others. And the court puts a temporary 24 hour hold on their guns so that that person can get a mental health evaluation. I don't know if that's the answer, but I think it's worth exploring. Last question over here. Yes, ma'am. Will there be debates between you and Mr. Grayson and the other candidates? Well, I'll put it to you this way. I will debate anybody, anywhere, anytime, any format. I cannot assure you that they would be willing to debate me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Go over there and meet the crowd. Yes.